So, welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Jürgen Joost, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig. And he will talk about non-positive curvature and geometric and analytic aspects of them. Please go ahead. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about some joint works that I did with Pavane Joharinat in Leipzig. And it also involves other people, but the papers are by the, by the two of us that I will report about. And I will speak about non-positive curvature, which is abbreviated as NPC. So why is that an important topic? Something that starts with non, could that ever be important? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, many important spaces have non-positive curvature in sense still to be defined. First of all, you all know hyperbolic spaces, which have negative curvature as remain in manifolds and Euclidean spaces have vanishing curvature and therefore zero is also non-positive. Then more generally, you have the symmetric spaces of non-compact type which in some directions have negative and others have zero curvature. Then you have other spaces which are no longer manifolds, in particular trees, metric trees, and more generally spaces that consist of higher dimensional simplices, but that keep branching. These are so-called Euclidean buildings constructed and studied by Bruja and Titz. Then many moduli spaces, that occur, for instance, in algebraic geometry can be equipped with a Riemannian metric that makes them non-positively curved. For instance, you have the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. You have the moduli space of abelian varieties, which in fact happens to be a symmetric space of non-compact type. And if you go beyond geometry, there's also a notion of hyperbolicity, which somehow means negative curvature introduced by Gromov into the study of groups. And according to his analysis, most groups are hyperbolic. So non-hyperbolic ones are relatively rare exceptions. And you can also geometrize a group, namely turn it into a Cayley graph, and then those Cayley graphs are also non-positively curved as metric spaces. Now, we have, I've just given you a list of many important spaces, but they're also not just, it's not just the spaces, but they're also important for constructions. Namely, if you want to study manifold, for instance, a Keller manifold, then in order to understand its topology, you foremost need to understand its fundamental group. And if you have a group, you typically look at its representations. And if you have a representation of a fundamental group of some Riemannian manifold, or of a Keller manifold, or of an algebraic manifold, then you obtain a mapping from the space M into some non positively curved space, depending on the representation, on the type of representation that, that you have. And so therefore in algebraic geometry, these spaces turn out to be quite important and it is important to study maps into such spaces. And then, as I will also explore here, there are important relations with concepts that come from a very different perspective from topology. And we have the concept of hyperconvexity that we will encounter in this talk. And in particular, there's an relations with a powerful tool to analyze metric data, which is called topological data analysis, and which is currently a very active branch of investigation. So what are characteristic properties of non-positive curvature? Well, you can express it quite easily. You have convexity properties, more precisely the square distance from a point or the square distance between geodesics is at least as convex as in the Euclidean case. So convexity is good. And to have an explicit comparison for convexity for a case which you understand well is even better. 
And in particular, those from that scheme essentially can turn most things that you can do with linear analysis in Euclidean space into convex analysis in non-positively curved spaces. And what will be particularly important for us, non-positive curvature can be characterized in terms of all intersection properties. As we will see and explore in this talk, balls in an NPC space intersect at least as easily as in the Euclidean case, although the intersection is relatively smaller. And non-positive curvature can be iterated. If you have a non-positively curved space and you look at the L2 space of mappings from some space X with a measure into that space, and this L2 space, again, is a non-positively curved space. So constructions can be iterated. And briefly coming to some regularity properties. Many years ago, I've introduced generalized harmonic maps into non-positively curved spaces. And it turns out that the Helder continuous which was shown independently by Fang Hua Lin and myself. When the domain satisfies some mild restrictions, it has to satisfy a Poincaré inequality and it has to satisfy a ball doubling property. That is, if you have a ball and you double its radius, then the volume of the larger ball is controlled by a certain factor times the volume of the original ball. So, volumes of balls don't grow uncontrollably fast. And very important work, Zhang and Zhu, Xi Ping Zhu, showed that such maps are even Lipschitz and the domain has a lower curvature bound, again, in generalized sense of Alexandrov. And together with Zhang, Zhang, Zhang and Zhu could also obtain estimates for the Lipschitz constant when the domain has Ritchie curvature bounded from below, also in some generalized sense into which I will not go, however. These are very beautiful analytical works. But today I shall be more concerned with the, geomet with the geometry of such, of such spaces. And, but even the regularity theory has kind of a geometric background. Namely, if you have a harmonic map, a generalized harmonic map into such a space, if you compose it, is a convex function on that space and you get a subharmonic function. And because of non-positive curvature, you have many convex functions, in particular those that come from, that arise from the distance function. And so you get many subharmonic functions and to these subharmonic functions, you can then apply Hanak inequalities and then you are in business with the regularity theory of elliptic PDEs. So now I will give you a short introduction into basic properties of metric geometry. It will not be difficult and some of you will know it already, but it's just a couple of notations and terminology. So we consider a metric space X comma D and for a continuous pass into that space that starts at some point X and ends at some point Y, we can define its length in the same way that you define the length of a rectifiable curve in Euclidean space. Then you take all partitions of the domain, which is a unit interval here for normalization purposes, and then look at the sum of the distances between the image points. And then you take the supremum over all partitions and of course, because of the triangle inequality that only can grow if you refine the partition. And so you assume that you have a finite supremum. And you call your space a length space. If the distance is realized, the distance between two points is realized that the infimum of the lengths of paths connecting these two points and if this infimum is realized, that is, if you find a pass whose length is equal to the distance between those two points, you call it the shortest geodesic. 
And if you can always find such a shortest geodesic between any two points, you call your space, you call your length space geodesic. Now, some further important notions. You have two points, then you call another point a midpoint. If the distance from either of the two points is one half of the distance between those two points. Just sits in the middle between X and Y. M sits in the middle between X and Y. And essentially you require that you always find such midpoints or also other points that sit between those two points. And when you can always do that, then you call the space Menga convex. So in particular in a Menga convex space, you always find midpoints between any two points. And so the condition is that what would be an inequality by the triangle in inequality becomes an equality for those points that sit between X1 and X2. And in particular, this is satisfied if the space is totally convex. That means if you have two points and if you consider closed balls around these two points, such that the sum of the radii is at least the distance between those two points then these two balls have a non-empty intersection. So two balls that can intersect, if the radii satisfy what is required by the triangle inequality, then these balls do intersect. So that is an important property and we will generalize that to more than two balls. So that will be an important aspect of the content of the talk. So keep that in mind. Space is totally convex if two balls that can intersect according, uh, according to the necessary inequalities, in fact, actually do intersect. And just for convention, all radii that I will consider in the sequel will be assumed to be positive. So now let's reformulate that. Looks a little more complicated, but this way of looking at will be important. So again, you take two radii that are bigger than the distance between the two points, X1 and X2. And then for every point, for every other point X, you look at the maximum of dx1 x d divided by r1 and dx2 x divided by r2. Then you take the infimum over all x and you take the supremum over all radii. And so when X happens to be a complete space. You can find these points in, in the middle. As we had in the case of totally geodesic point, uh, spaces or manga convex space, you always find these points in the middle. And then you can in fact achieve O of X1 and X2 to be equal to one. M is a midpoint between X1 and X2, then 2D X1M is equal to DX1 X2, and the same for, for X2. So, of course, that is the best possible case. In general, this row might be bigger than, than one. You think about it, little bit about in terms of the triangle inequality, you see that O equal to one is the best that you can possibly achieve. So now this is for, for two points, but the essential, an essential idea will be to look at the corresponding condition for three points and we give that a name. 
So a geodesic length space is called a tripod space. For any three points now, there exists a median that is a point that is between any two of them. So that is the condition there. Dx1m plus dx2m is equal to the distance between x1 and x2, and likewise for x1 and x3 and x2 and x3. So the condition can also be rewritten in the form below equation one, namely that the sum of the three distances is twice the sum of the distances of each of them from that midpoint or median M. And here you also see a picture which shows the easy geometric conditions that we are talking about. So now most metric spaces however, are not tripod spaces. In general, for instance, in Euclidean space, you wouldn't find such a point. But there uh, do exist some examples. So metric trees are tripod spaces, as you in fact can actually see from, from, from the figure. Yeah, so if things keep branching like a tree, then you always find such midpoints. And importantly, also L infinity spaces satisfy this tripod condition, tripod condition. Also in general, there's this median or midpoint M need no longer be unique. In the metric tree, it is unique in L infinity space in general not, but we don't require uniqueness. So there's a general class of spaces, the so-called hyperconvex spaces, which in fact include both metric trees and the L infinity spaces where this property holds, that is, which are tripod spaces. And I will come to those because I assume that even though they're quite important, they may not be familiar to many of you. But before I do that, let me already outline the strategy. Namely, we define curvature, we want to define curvature as a deviation from the tripod property. No longer we are comparison with Euclidean space, but by comparison with, with the tripod space. So the tripod space is kind of an ideal space which satisfy, satisfies an ideal condition and actual spaces remain in manifolds or whatever deviate from that, from such a tripod space in terms that can be quantified and that will be quantified in this talk. And by the way, if you have questions in between, just let let me know and, and interrupt me. Okay, I, I have one question. Yes, so please. For this metric uh, tree, so so if the, this M, so it, now we consider X1, X2, X, uh, uh, M. So it's yeah. still can find the one, one example, uh, one point. Yeah, well then, then M of course, is the, the midpoint itself. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Yeah. So that, in fact, that, that, that is, is a good question though. For example, the real yeah, yeah. line okay. also satisfies this, this property. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, I think that that is, is a good question that, that Claire may have to clarify things for, for, for the <laughs> audience. Yeah, so. Now, I want to formulate it in terms, again, of intersection properties. Now, I have three points and three radii, and the radii satisfy, again, the condition that is needed by the triangle inequality for the balls to potentially intersect. And in the tripod space, when the ball satisfies this condition, they actually do intersect. We formerly had it for two points, now we require it for three points at intersection property. And again, what we did before, we can, can generalize. Yeah, We can look now at the quotient dxi, x divided by ri. 
Now for all three points, then takes the infimum over all x in our space. And now you can actually characterize those Ri where for which the infimum is achieved. And in fact, these are, I are given by the Gromov products. So the Gromov products measure to what extent the triangle inequality is not an equality. For well, the first one is you take x2, x3, and then you intersperse x1. Yeah, and for the second one, you take x1, x3, and intersperse x2. And in every case, you check to what extent the triangle inequality is a true inequality, that is how much it deviates from being an equality. And these are the Gromov products is because they have been introduced by Gromov. And so for computing this inf, you just need to have these particular values of the Ri's that are given by the Gromov products. And then when you find some X, which is infimum is attained, then you call it a weighted circumcenter or whichever name you want to, to give it. And in fact, it solves an optimization problem in R3 with respect to some L infinity norm because we look at, at, at some inf and, and, and some max. And for example, you always find such a weighted circumcenter for triangles in Katsio spaces. I will introduce them in a moment, which constitute Alexandrov's generalization of remaining manifolds of non-positive sectional curvature. So in particular, you can find such weighted circumcenters in triangles in simply connected remaining manifolds of non-positive sectional curvature complete. We assume them always to be complete. So now we yeah, did have that for two points originally, then we required it for three points. And then of course you can actually ask what happens if you require it for more than three points. In fact, for an arbitrary number of points. And if that is satisfied, we call the space hyperconvex. So you have a family of points, arbitrary index set, and for any two points, and you have a family of radii such that the sum of the corresponding radii is always bigger or equal than the distance between those two points. And so then, if that is satisfied, we require that all these balls have a common intersection. Of course, so if you have a convex metric space, then by the definition I gave earlier, any two such balls intersect. Yeah, and hyperconvexity then requires that ever when you have a family of balls that intersect pairwise, then they also have a common intersection. Or again, coming back to our slogan, balls that can intersect do intersect. Which we had two balls, and we had three balls, now we have arbitrarily many balls. And in particular, of course, hyperconvex spaces are tripod spaces. But of course, they satisfy a stronger property. But here are some, some pictures of spaces that not all of which are hyperconvex. So in the first picture, we have these three green balls in Euclidean space, they intersect pairwise. Yeah. Remember that we always look at closed balls, but they don't have a triple intersection. So the space 
is not to tripod space and the space is not hyperconvex. Euclidean space is not hyperconvex. In the bottom, you have L1, the balls, with respect to the L1 norm on R2. And here, in fact, you see that the tripod property is satisfied. But for L1 spaces in higher dimensions, it's no longer satisfied. It's just L1 of R2. But for L infinity spaces, it is satisfied in any dimension. Now let's turn to the right hand side. There so again, you have a metric tree. Three points are marked. And of course, as we have seen earlier, you have this median, and you easily check that they also satisfy the hyperconvexity property. Now, let's finally turn to the circle, which is kind of as different as possible from the hyperconvexity condition. You have three equally spaced points on, on the circle, just distance two pi over three between any two of them. And if you take balls of radius pi over three around them, then the intersect pairwise. But of course you don't have a triple intersection un until you double the radius of the balls. If you take balls of radius of radii two pi over three, then they have a triple intersection. So, Pairwise intersection for pi over three, triple intersection only for two pi over three. So you have to fully double the radius of the balls to get a triple intersection. So let me recall some properties of hyperconvex spaces. They are complete and contractible to each of their points. That was already shown by Aaron Shine and Panich Bhakti, who introduced those spaces first. And contractible to each of their points in particular means that they don't have non-trivial topology. I'll, I'll return to that important aspect. Then you also have an Lipschitz extension property, so the space is hyperconvex, if and only if every one Lipschitz map from a subspace of any metric space y to x can be extended to one Lipschitz map over the entire space. There's no obstruction to Lipschitz extensions. And then there was a very important discovery of Ispel and Dress independently, namely every metric space can be isometrically embedded into some hyperconvex space. It's essentially constructed as an L infinity space of distance functions, and that is called the, its hyperconvex hull. So the hyper, in particular, the hyperconvex hull of a compact space is compact, and that of a finite space is no longer finite, but becomes a simplicial complex. And so there's, in fact, an important relation with topological data analysis. In topological data analysis, you have a cloud of points with mutual distances. And so you look at balls of some fixed radius R. And whenever you have an intersection of Q plus one balls, then you declare that you have a Q simplex, that is a simplex spanned by, by Q plus one points. And the idea of topological data analysis is that you record or the homology of the simplicial complex varies as a function of R. Our homology groups appear and may again disappear or may not disappear depending on, on the topology when you when you increase r from zero to the value equal to the diameter of the space. That is topological data analysis. And that gives you certain pictures. You record that in, in any dimension for which range of r, you have homology groups in that dimension. And that gives you so-called barcode. And that is taken as a 
as a characteristic image of such a metric space. And it has found many applications in various fields. But you can you already see from this that this idea of topo topological data analysis is strongly related to the geometric idea of hyperconvexity, which I will now explore further. Jürgen? Yes. Uh, a quick question, uh, a clarification question. Um, before you said that a Euclidean space is not a tripod space, and then um, if I was following correctly, that hyperconvex spaces are tripod spaces, and now you're saying that every metric space is isometrically embedded in a hyperconvex space. So I can yes. embed, I can embed Euclidean space in a hyperconvex space, and that makes it into a tripod space. Is that uh, yeah. would that be correct? Um, I mean, the hyperconvex hull is a tripod space, not not the space itself. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Is the whole yeah. okay? It's a different thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, let's look at an easy example. If just have three, three points with, with their distances, then the hyperconvex hull would be the metric tree, the metric tree connecting these three points. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and if you have four points, then what you get is a rectangle with four additional edges joining those points. And for example, if you have the corner points of a regular hexagon, yeah, then mm -hmm. the, its hyperconvex hull is the unit, the unit cube. Okay. Um, is it easy to visualize the hyperconvex hull of Euclidean space? Well, that is some kind of L infinity space. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank in you. general, you, I mean, the, the elements, in fact, essentially are, are distance functions from, from, from the points. I see. Thanks. Well, but we are also. You also want to relax the condition a little. So we call it a space is called delta hyperbolic. If you, for some possibly positive delta, if you get this intersection property, if you enlarge the radii by delta. If delta is equal to zero, of course, you have the original hyperconvexity, but for positive delta, you make the condition a little easier to satisfy. Or you can ask, instead of adding a constant, you can also ask what, can you multiply the radii by some fixed factor, at least one in order to get this common intersection of all the balls. Then you call the space lambda hyperconvex. Again, lambda equal to one is the original hyperconvexity. Bigger lambda, of course, makes it easier to satisfy. Both are important. So for large radii, if you look at asymptotic properties, then of course delta becomes insignificant. And so if you want to look at the asymptotics of a space, uh, then being delta hyperbolic for some positive delta is essentially as good as being hyperconvex. The advantage of Lambda hyperconvexity is that, of course, this relation is invariant under scaling the metric D. And for example, Hilbert spaces are square root of two hyperconvex. In particular, Euclidean spaces are square root of two hyperconvex. So if you enlarge all radia by a factor of square root of two, then you always get an intersection. And reflexive and dual banner spaces are too hyperconvex. They could, of course, be, be better, but some, in particular, certain L1 spaces are only too hyperconvex, but not better. Jurgen, can I interrupt with a question also? Um, the, yes, the two, please. The two, thing, the two things in the definition, when combined, look like the, what might be the definition of coarse isometry or coarse isometric. And I'm just wondering if. Uh, Yes. Comment on that. Yes. Maybe comment on it later, but I just since you have no, I, I will not talk about cost isometries, but of course you raise a very good point that, that, that this is, is related here. Yeah, namely that for cost isometries you again relax uh, the, the condition a little 
I mean, we are not talking about, about mappings here, but the idea, of course, is the same. Yeah, so you make it easier and you, you, you relax the condition. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so L infinity space, L infinity space uh, one hyperconvex, is a, that is a hyperconvex. Two is kind of the worst case that you can have. That you can have, we saw it as the example of the three points on the unit circle. Yeah, so the unit circle is only two hyperconvex and L1 space in higher dimensions, dimension bigger than, than two, also only two hyperconvex. And the other LP spaces are, in fact, all a little better than, than two hyperconvex. And L2 is square root of two hyperconvex. So now let's see, let's first recall the standard definitions of non positive curvature. First, we have Alexandrov's condition which is illustrated by the picture below. We have three points, x1, x2, x3. And then you construct a Euclidean comparison triangle, x1 bar, x2 bar, x3 bar, with distances that are equal to those in the original space. So the distance between x1 and x3 is equal to the distance between x1 bar and x3 bar and, and, and so on. Yeah, and then cut zero means that other distances in that triangle are not longer, could be, could be smaller than those in the Euclidean case. So for example, if you connect X3 with the midpoint of the geodesic from X1 to X2, then that distance cannot be larger than the one when you connect X3 bar in the Euclidean plane with a straight line from X1 bar to X2 bar. So that is Alexandrov's condition. Then you have Busemann's condition. You just take two geodesics that start at the same point, and then you look at the distance as the parameter increases. So geodesics are always parameterized proportionally to arc lengths. Now, and then you look at the distance between these two geodesics, the points on these geodesics as a function of the parameter, and you require that this be convex. Of course, in the Euclidean space, it's linear, but in a non-positively curved space in the sense of Boosman, it has to be convex. This condition is somewhat more general than that of cut zero spaces. And so our definition then says, if for each triple of points and with a comparison triangle, this midpoint distance, this distance from the weighted circumcenter is not larger than that in the Euclidean plane. There was an earlier version of this that was done with Armin Chikora whom I'm happy to have in the audience today and other collaborators. But now with Pavane Joharinat, we explored that, that more, more systematically. And so again, we have these relations that I had earlier, this row of the three points and the row of the three bar points. And we require that in the original space is not larger than in the Euclidean plane. So the median or the weighted circumcenter or whatever you want to call it is at least as close to the vertices of the triangle as in the Euclidean case. And so you can also formulate it in terms of lambda or rho hyperconvexity. So the space is at least as hyperconvex as the Euclidean plane. Or still putting it differently, the balls do not have to be enlarged by a larger factor than in the Euclidean case in order to get a triple intersection. 
if the distances between any two points are the same in the original space and in the Euclidean plane. So in particular, tripod spaces have non-positive curvature in that sense, because there we have rho equal to one, which is the smallest possible value. So I just want to get the logic straight. It seems like now in this definition, you only need your index set to have cardinality three, whereas your other definition. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm back to three points again. Yeah. But we have the example of, of arbitrary many points in, in, in the back of our minds, and I will return to that later. Yeah. Of course, you could then also require a corresponding condition for four points, for instance. Yeah, but already for three points, we see important geometric content. So good. And also complete Katzeo space, that is Alexandrov space of non positive curvature, have non positive curvature in our sense. But the converse is not true because our spaces can be much, much more general. They need not be geodesic. So, and, and they don't need to have unique geodesics. For example, L in, in L infinity spaces, geodesics are not unique, but still you have the tripod condition. And in particular, if you look at an approximate version, uh, for example, if you, if you ignore small radii, or if you allow for delta hyperbolicity with a small constant delta, then this applies to discrete spaces. And in particular, we can then use this notion in order to explore the asymptotic geometry, the large scale geometry of discrete spaces. And to see whether they behave in some kind of hyperbolic or non positively curved manner, as asymptotically, they, they look like tripod spaces. That is, if you have three points that are quite far away, then you find some point which satisfies the tripod condition up to some small error. And so therefore this could be important for data analysis. And we are currently also exploring that aspect in, in some projects. And in particular, if you have a complete remaining manifold, then it has non-positive curvature if it has non-positive sectional curvature. Let's assume that it is, is, is simply connected actually. And so the idea is the following. So the important step is if you have non-positive curvature, then we should have sectional curvature smaller than, 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 than zero. And so let's let's try to draw a little. Yeah, so we have our triangle in our remaining manifold. And we assume that it has non-positive curvature. Then we have two comparison, Euclidean comparison triangles, one with the same side lengths. Then here we have this midpoint here. And then we have also this triangle here. Yeah, and then we look at the comparison triangle, which has the same angles at this point here, and which has uh, the, the same distances from the midpoint, and then we get this triangle here. So essentially by the non-positive curvature condition, the second triangle in the Euclidean case, the second comparison triangle is smaller than, than the first one, but in the, in the original space, the two coincide. And so that means that if we go from, from this median here, same distances here and here, then the lengths of the sides in the original space are larger than those 
in the Euclidean comparison plane. And so that means that geodesics are diverging faster than in, than in the Euclidean space. And so that then means that the space has non-positive sectional curvature by known theor easy and known theorems in Riemannian geometry. So that is essentially the, uh, the geometric idea of, of, of the pool. So that of course is just to check that our condition is a natural condition of non-positive curvature. In the Riemannian case, it should coincide with non-positive sectional curvature, which is a criterion for any meaningful condition of non-positive curvature. So now let's draw some conclusions here. Let's again come back to the idea of topological data analysis. So this slide again is, is quite full, but the content is pretty easy. This uh, original topological construction of check and, and others to define homology of, of general topological spaces. So you have some topological space and you have a cover by, by open sets. So in my case, actually closed sets would, would be more suitable. And when you have such a cover, you construct a simplicial complex from the intersection properties. Yeah, that is whenever a couple of these sets have a non-empty intersection, then you insert the corresponding simplex. Now you assume that all intersections are contractible, that is intersection pattern itself, doesn't have local topology, then the homology of this check complex equals the homology of the space X. And so that of course is a useful way, for example, of, of computing homology of, of topological spaces. And in particular, when our topological space is a metric space, we can use covers by distance balls. And now, of course, we recall our hyperconvexity condition. And we have a hyperconvex metric space. And if we have a cover by distance balls, that is whenever a couple of balls have a non-empty inter subsets of balls have non-empty in intersection. If, for example, you have K balls and every family of K minus one balls have a non-empty intersection, then also the entire collection has a non-empty intersection. And so translated into simplicial topology, that means whenever the simplicial complex contains all the boundary facets of some simplex, it also contains that simplex itself. That is, the simplicial complex has no holes, no unfilled simplices. And therefore, from that, you don't get any, any contribution to homology. So when we only require lambda hyperconvexity, then of course non-trivial homology groups may arise, but you know how, by how much you have to enlarge the radius of the ball to, to kill all these local homology groups, homology contributions. And so from that perspective, hyperconvex spaces are the simplest model spaces because uh, you don't have any local homology from the corresponding check cover. And therefore homology can be seen as a topological measure of the deviation from such a model that is from, hyper, from a hyperconvex space. And of course, from homology groups, you create integer invariants, namely the Betty numbers. But now the point is that this is just topology and geometry, geometry can provide us with more refined real valued invariants. Now this, we can check about these values of lambda. And of course, the fundamental geometric invariants, according to Riemann, are curvatures. And so you see 
or curvature notions can refine topological concepts. And I've provided a framework here so that the essential geometric content of curvature can now be extracted for general metric spaces. The curvature, of course, was originally only defined for a many manifolds and then generalized to certain space by Alexandrov and Busemann and, and, and others. But here we have some notion that extracts the essential geometric content of curvature in terms of intersection properties of collections of balls and that works for arbitrary metric spaces. And the basic model class for our curvature notion is given by the tripod spaces, which show the best intersection properties for three balls. And these are a special class of spaces. And they con contain the even more special class, namely the hyperconvex spaces. So now from that abstract perspective, the geometric content of curvature is the deviation from the tripod condition. That is why I said I will use tripod spaces as a natural model spaces as opposed to Euclidean spaces for for defining curvature. And Euclidean space and only have a subsidiary role, namely based on some normalization of curvature that assigns the value zero to them. Of course, in some sense, there's still a borderline case because if you admit positive curvature, then you would no longer have the convexity conditions of the distance function. So now we can also more generally translate topology into geometry. We have a metric space XD, and now we construct a simplicial comple complex whose vertex set consists of pairs, points in the space and non-negative radii. And then we insert a simplex whenever the corresponding balls have a non-trivial intersection. That is, if we increase the radii, we get, of course, more and more non-trivial intersections. And so more and more simplices are inserted when, when the radii increase. And so that, of course, then is the space also underlying topological data analysis. And in particular, when we keep the, all the R's the same, this would be slices in our space, and these are particular those sets or constructions that are evaluated in topological data analysis. So we now have identified a geometric framework in which topological data analysis becomes geometrically very natural. Now I'm coming to the end. Now this is just in some sense just the beginning of a project. So there are many questions. For instance, you can turn back to analysis. You can define energies, which then have con certain convexity properties for maps into such spaces. And you can analyze the regularity theory for maps into such spaces that minimize some energy functional. Energies, of course, again, are constructed in terms of square distances and we're scaling them and maybe letting the distances go go to zero. Then from this construction, you can have more schemes for what I might call geometric data analysis as opposed to simply topological data analysis. You can study then empirical data sets, networks, that is points with, point clouds with distances. You can look at the asymptotic geometry and that is a joint project that we currently carry out with Arijit Samal, who heads the partner group of our institute in Chennai in India. And then from a geometric perspective, there are many questions about the geometry of hyperconvex and tripod spaces, in particular, how to systematically con construct hyperconvex hulls, for instance. 
And so these are our current papers and we are working on, on, on producing more. So thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Thank you very much.